Hello and welcome to this Telecoms.com webinar produced in association with Sunvine. I'm James Middleton, Managing Editor of Telecoms.com, and I'm joined today by Chris Frederick, who is Director of Technology Partnerships in the Office of the CTO at Policy Management firm Sunvine. I found it interesting when I attended Mobile World Congress in February this year that there was a clear shift from the usual discussion about new devices and infrastructure technologies that reflected the growing importance of software in the mobile space. In fact, the number of software players that made announcements during that week caused one of my colleagues to quip that there should be a Mobile Support Systems World Congress. Indeed, the growing importance of analytics in the next phase of service development and customer management was underlined by a number of announcements around data analysis. This is going to be one of the key points of discussion today, and Chris is going to talk about overcoming the challenges when implementing standards-based accurate charging. Analytics is key when implementing differentiated charging. The Sandvine will tell you that insight plus analysis equals intelligence, and intelligence equals informed decisions. This insight allows you as an operator to efficiently and effectively align your data charging models with subscribers' internet usage, taking into account user demand and a standard compliant policy and charging control framework suitable for evolution to LTE. So Chris will look at different mechanisms that a communication service provider can employ to implement online and offline charging use cases and their relative strengths and challenges. The particular areas to focus on will include how marketing within the CSP can learn how to meet subscribers' needs with a variety of service plan options segmented by usage events, location, time of day, application or device. How network planning and operations can understand how policy control can integrate seamlessly within standard PCC architectures, and how all can explore and the example use cases of differentiated service plans that benefit from quick time to market and simplified ongoing network maintenance. But to return to my earlier point about MWC this year, the overall message is that telecom software support systems are no longer back office. They're now mainstream so far as the industry is concerned. And while new handsets and operating systems may grab the headlines from time to time, it's the means of supporting these devices and mitigating their effects on the mobile broadband networks, which is occupying the attention of the telecoms industry right now. So 2012 promises to be an exciting year in the OSS and BSS sectors, as the industry moves into the next phase of support software deployment. Despite the economic gloom which still hangs over many of the world's major economies, there is room for optimism in most of the geographical regions as operators in the mature markets begin to explore the possibilities of policy-based online and offline charging. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Chris, who will also be available after his presentation to take your questions. You can enter them at any time in the text box on this page, and Chris will answer them when he's finished speaking. Chris, over to you. Thanks very much, James. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody who's on the bridge, and thank you for uh, taking the time to, to join today. I'm Chris Frederick. I'm Director of Technology Partnerships at uh, Sandvine, where I've been for uh, pretty much, uh, well, uh, almost six years now, working in the office of the CTO, and I'm, I'm really responsible for broadening our ecosystem of interoperable partners and also responsible for um, all the technical marketing around our usage management suite. And I'll be talking about uh, some of the challenges related to that suite today or, or implementing those solutions. The topic is overcoming the challenges of implementing accurate standards-based charging. And looking at agenda, we're going to be discussing today uh, some of those challenges that are facing operators. I'll give a brief overview or introduction to the 3GPP HC policy and charging control architecture, just to, to level set everyone's awareness of, of that architecture. We'll look at some options or approaches for overcoming those challenges that I, I'll discuss, and then uh, wrap up with some strategies for success and an online Q&A at the end. So please do stick around for that. So what are the challenges? Well, it, it really depends on who you speak to. Business uh, people and operators tend to, to think in terms of use cases and monetization of, of the network. So they tend to think of things like the need for business intelligence to structure a new service tiers in, in a way that's going to match the needs of subscribers best. Uh, they think in terms of use cases like bill shock notification, whether that's for the need to meet regulatory requirements or otherwise uh, you know, offer services like fair use policies in order to meet market demands. 
know, family plans are another example that there's gaining some currency that we see in the market. In other words, the need to offer plans where uh, different members of the family can contribute and share usage against a common quota from different devices. Just continuing on, some of the others, application-aware service bundles. So the challenge to overcome is the need to accurately identify different applications in order to potentially zero rate those or rate them in a different way from other applications. And finally, uh, to apply all these different services consistently over converged networks, that's definitely a trend uh, in the network, uh, network convergence. And uh, w operators who have, um, for example, a 3G uh, mobile infrastructure as well as cable or, or DSL or, or um, WiMAX infrastructure, they often want to offer the same services, count quota consistently across those different access networks. And that's very important. So in general, they're thinking about uh, services to make money. A novel concept, but <laughs> very important. So that, that can really encompass anything from flexible policy-based usage tracking of users based on IP or protocol, but toward a certain goal to enable captive portals, billing cycle support uh, for, for different cycles, top-up usage detailed records for archiving purposes, etc. When we shift the focus to engineering, and we in engineering, we, we, we hear um, many of the same challenges, but from a slightly different perspective. They too are interested in business intelligence, uh, but often from a, a capacity planning uh, perspective rather than from a, an ARPU optimization perspective. They need to understand in the usage-based billing context, what are the applications that are, are consuming different amounts of bandwidth, and then that's important for planning from a zero rating offering that you need to understand how much of that traffic will be zero rated and what that accounts for in terms of overall network utilization. Uh, they need to offer uh, these services at LTE speeds, but without overshooting on bill shock. And similarly, uh, FUP there is, is fair use policy, but that needs to be coordinated with bill shock as well. Some of you might be aware that Recently in Europe, there was an operator that was fined uh, because the bill shock notifications uh, were not in line with, with the actual bills. So the likely the case there was that uh, the GTSN was probably sending bytes toward a, a, a PCEF for bill shock, but the bytes toward the uh, online charging server for billing were, were not exactly the same. So basically, there's usage data that's being sent to all these different systems and potentially analytics as well, or, or, or a system for, for fair use policy. These are all consuming these volume data, but they're consuming them on different intervals potentially, and that can be a problem when you have multiple consumers of the same data like that. Just to finish off on the challenges, a few other examples. I mentioned family plans at the beginning, but messages there have to hit the, the correct online charging server as well. And from the application awareness aspect, again, a user's idea of Facebook is not necessarily the same as the wire's idea uh, of Facebook. And the, and the perception there uh, has, to, has to meet the reality in terms of how that application is counted and, and measured and the usage of that is reported. There's different ways to overcome these challenges, of course. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about routing traffic at the source, which is, which is our standpoint's approach today to, to make sure that, for example, messages do hit the, the correct uh, online charging server, but I'll also be talking about other options, um, such as the use of a, a diameter routing agent to accomplish that. And finally, uh, I'll also uh, touch on the, the, the need to manage uh, signaling complexity and some of the challenges that relate to interoperability. As we'll see, uh, or as I'm sure most people know, there's a wide range of, of online charging server and, and PCRF vendors, and uh, the need to interoperate with many of them uh, can be a, a challenge for, for many vendors. Policy and charging control architecture. This is a very, very simplified diagram that contains elements related to both prepaid and postpaid charging. And I'll, I just wanted to include a, a one architectural slide like this just so that we can level set expectations and, and understanding for the, uh, the remainder of the, of the deck. Because of the real-time account updating that's required in a prepaid scenario, this is also called online charging. And postpaid is also called offline charging. So I'll use those, those terms interchangeably throughout the remainder of the presentation. I've marked a number of different interfaces here. RO and RF are, are IETF standards. GY is, is essentially a RO with 3G ADPs, or attribute value pairs. Uh, GZ is RF with 3G ADPs. 
and as I said, this, this is a very uh, simplified diagram. There, there could be, for example, mediation between the policy uh, charging enforcement point and the OFCS or the, the offline charging server, but that could also be built into the, the OFCS as well. Before I go on, I, sh I should note that Sandmine's products are, of course, also compliant with other standards such as packet cable multimedia and the cable domain. But for this webinar, I'll focus on the, on the PCC reference architecture just uh, for simplicity's sake. Finally, one more point here. SY, for those who aren't uh, uh, familiar with that, is a, is a proposed release, a web interface between the OCS, as you can see, and, and, the, and the PCRF. Those standards are leaning toward SOAP-based interface that, that runs in the service layer versus the control plane, and that will enable out-of-session communication between those two elements. So the OCS can communicate with the PCRF via SY, and then uh, the PCRF will then be able to drive enforcement directives uh, via GX to the, to the PCEF. And that concept is, is really being promoted actively by vendors that have both of those elements uh, as it tends to reinforce the role of the PCRF in a number of use cases that they otherwise don't necessarily have much of a role in, at least from a standards perspective. The count from uh, Sesame Street, of course, just a couple more words on uh, the differences between prepaid and postpaid charging. The most important difference uh, between the two is that when a user wants to use a prepaid service, the network has to decide whether that should be allowed and that's decided according to the subscriber's current account balance. So as a result, uh, there are some consequences for prepaid systems. Essentially, before each service usage, you basically have to ask permission from the charging system, and that's what's called credit authorization. The practical challenge there is that uh, the charging system, therefore, has to know what the subscriber's account balance is in real time. And that can't be achieved by collecting data about uh, usage and processing it, for example, at the end of the month or, or at the end of the week or something, as is usually done in postpaid systems. E each and every time or use of a prepaid service has to have some immediate deduction from the account. Both prepaid and postpaid charging procedures can also be divided in, into two general categories. There's, there's event-based and session-based charging. Uh, event-based charging is used for discrete one-time charging for an event. And session-based charging is used when there's a need to maintain a session throughout a service. And typically, there are a few requests to the billing system there. Uh, the, the first request, there may be some updates if the session parameters change, like if I'm on a Skype call, and then I enable the video camera, and then when the, when the session is finished. So what are the options for overcoming some of those challenges that I discussed off the top? Well, there are different ways to generate and communicate usage data in a standards compliant framework in order to enable prepaid and postpaid charging use cases. There's GY, there's uh, usage over DX, there's the output of usage data records, the VX uh, interface, which is essentially a CSV or flat text file out interface. And I'm also going to talk about at the end a Sandline's own quota manager product. Let's start with GY, which is really used for online charging services. GY as an interface is actually defined in, in TS32299, which is in the online charging sections, and it, it provides a standards-based mechanism for usage data to be communicated. As I mentioned, the purpose of online charging is really to provide charging information to the OCS so that it can do that credit control before any usage action is allowed. That means that a subscriber account has to exist in the OCS and that check of whether to allow or disallow the requested usage to determine its dollar value or other units, and to debit uh, from that account, that all has to happen before the usage, or at least during the usage. So what are some of the challenges that are inherent in this approach? For one thing, uh, there is the, the concept of standards compliance versus interpretation. People familiar with the dynamic standards will know that there is room for, uh, for differences in interpretation. Sandvine has probably completed, I would say, close to 40 uh, GX and GY integrations or IOTs with different uh, vendors, really all the, all the, the leading uh, PCRF and OCS vendors in the space. And there is quite a wide range of differences between different vendors' implementations of, of supposedly the same standards. There's also potentially a need for a diameter routing agent or something to manage the, the, all of the signaling. Some OCSs may require that. It really depends on their capacity, the number that are deployed in the network, and so on. Overall, though, GUI is quite a good approach. There are a number of strengths, uh, common use case strengths, uh, it, when you're using 
why. For one thing, there's no need for a PCRF. So, so prepaid and online charging services can be delivered without that added expense and, or complexity. You can really do a lot with GUI. You can do service-based charging for time, for example, on a video service. You can't do that with GX or usage over GX. So it's quite flexible. There's also very little uh, quota overshoot in general, and that, that equates, of course, to revenue leakage. So GUI is quite accurate. As well, OCSs are all, as an entity are also very well suited for managing dollars and for converting usage units, for example, bytes into dollars and, or so on. So if the use case calls for, for example, um, you know, tax calculations to be factored in into the, uh, the, the flow or um, calculations of, uh, for example, the cost of, of the customer premise equipment, then usage of an, uh, of an, of an online charging server and, and reporting of, of volume or event usage uh, via GY is, is quite a good approach. This is just one example of an implementation that uh, Sandvine did with Telefonica in Latin America. And here we are working uh, with an OCS to realize so this solution and reporting a uh, usage uh, via GY. Some of the challenges that we'll overcome here was, uh, well, the, one of the main challenges, of course, for the business people was um, Telefonica wanted to increase average revenue per user, while at the same time increasing subscriber satisfaction. So the idea was that they needed to or wanted to identify something of value to a subset of subscribers, and they used our business intelligence analytics and reporting to do that. So the, the need was obviously also encompassing um, accurate application identification and the ability to, to differentially rate different applications and protocols. In the end, what was offered, as you can see here, was a different service bundles where uh, subscribers are able to pay a certain number of, of pesos every month to get unlimited usage. So it's sort of a hybrid usage plan where you know it's not an all-you-can-eat flat rate plan, but there are uh, certain applications that have been identified uh, through business intelligence as being very important and valued by subscribers that uh, they're willing to pay uh, extra for in order to have that price certainty of, of unlimited usage without incurring any overages. Usage monitoring over GX, uh, going uh, to another approach here. So uh, PCRF solutions have recently adopted some aspects of quota management, but in general I would say that it, it's not as mature as GY. Uh, for example, there's a number of limitations with GX. There are a lot of timers in GY, for example, that GX doesn't have. You can only have a 100% threshold uh, w what you're granted, and that's also why there can be um, quite a bit more overshoot on quota uh, with this approach than with the previously uh, discussed GY approach. There's no 80%, for example, threshold. Usage monitoring over GX is a, a release nine construct. Uh, it's defined in TS 29.212 in the section titled Reporting Accumulated Usage. Uh, some of you may also recall that uh, GX over GUI was also um, available in an earlier version, but that was descoped after release 6. The challenges, well, as I mentioned, um, there can be overshoot. It lacks some of the timers. You can do service-based charging uh, for time with GUI, but you can't do that with GX. So in general, usage over GX is, is only for volume. It's not used for high-based quotas, and, that, and that's a very important limitation. Of course, you also can't track dollar units in the same way that, that you can for GY, as I described. So there's, an, there's no innate rating engine for converting dollars into megabytes or minutes. I think one of the main challenges with this approach is, is that there's no use case that actually requires this per se. You have the potential for introducing more signaling complexity, the possible need for some kind of diameter routing agent between the OCS and PCRF and between the OCS and PCEF, and between the PCRF and PCEF, and so on. So there's an increase in complexity, as well as a, a potential for increased latency in, in triggering policy enforcements. But that said, in terms of strengths, I, I think you know there's also the potential for, in certain cases, I think you could see that the total cost of ownership could actually be lower. Uh, but that would really only be true if an OCS were not required. So in a case where the PCRF were holding quota, then it, it, it might uh, make sense. Uh, I think the only charging-related rule that it really makes sense for the PCRF to be present in is, is really for threshold notifications. Currently, that's an idea that it isn't addressed well in the, in the GUI specifications. But of course, there's nothing that prevents the online charging server 
from implementing a specific message type to indicate thresholds to the enforcement uh, node either. And actually, I believe that that is, in fact, being proposed through some extensions. Finally, the, uh, the question of the PCRF OCS interaction. I mentioned the need for possible um, you know, diameter or routing agent or, or some other entity to, to, to balance and, and, and steer that kind of traffic and manage that signaling load. There are different approaches. SY is also posited by some as, as, a, as a potential approach. Some vendors are suggesting that um, coordination could be done via the SPR. We don't favor that because, again, because of the signaling overload. That's very resource intensive because an SPR is, is, a, is a persistent database. And in complex rating, that would be uh, messaging every time a CCR uh, update is exchanged. So, you know, in general, diameter is not a cheap way to communicate between systems. And anything that can reduce the signaling overload is, is probably a good idea. So certainly a number of challenges, but definitely um, an idea that can be used uh, where it makes sense. I've uh, alluded to diameter routing agents uh, a number of times now, so it's probably worth uh, introducing the concept in a little more detail. First of all, why? Why the need? Well, I've mentioned with the uh, rollout of innovative services, there's, a, there's an increase in, in the messaging or transaction rates between systems. Some examples of that would be um, you know, the increase in machine-to-machine uh, -machine communication, the complex messaging that, that we associate with your um, usage plans or with um, uh, usage cases like uh, sponsored data connectivity and so on. As I mentioned, diameter is, is not is a, is a relatively expensive method for signaling, but of course, as the core signaling protocol for three key and LT networks, necessary for authentication, for policy, for charging, uh, or at least used in those mobility, and between a number of different um, nodes and elements in the network, PCFs, uh, PCRS, MME, etc. So Sandline has the ability to choose diameter endpoints based on policy already, based on session attributes, subscriber IDs, GX, and so on. And that obviates some need for diameter routing. Uh, you know, the PTS, the Sandline PTS, can initiate a GY uh, to a correct OCS among a pool based on, on whatever uh, criteria are specified. And I think just as important as well is just reducing signaling overload through best practices. But Nevertheless, let's take a closer look at a DRA and, and, and look at that in more detail. This is the diameter mesh nightmare that I, I alluded to. So on the left, we see some, some TCEFs and TDS uh, elements. On the right, PCRFs and online charging servers. So there are, there are different types of, of DRAs or, or diameter routing agents. But in general, the role is to, to route uh, load balance and or translate diameter messages between all of these different nodes. And that can mitigate the need for, for every diameter node to, to peer with each other. And it also, in cases where there's a need to choose or uh, to involve one or more PCRFs in charging use cases, it can, it can potentially dramatically uh, reduce the necessary diameter signaling. So if you think about the diameter uh, the mesh uh, mess <laughs> that was shown on the, on the previous slide, putting a DRA in can really provide a um, a node that simplifies that signaling and increases the efficiency. So in this case, the PCEFs, uh, TDS, only need to know about the diameter router node. And um, adding uh, devices on the right uh, requires no configuration changes on the, the elements on the left. So this could potentially help to scale the network, uh, simplify addition of new services. And in this example, the DRA in the middle might choose uh, you know, appropriate devices on, on the right based on load or configured policy and so on. That could also help uh, in, in cases where there's a failure on the right. Um, you, you know, there is a real potential in some networks for cascading failure scenarios. But um, if the, the DRA in the middle can shed load uh, as needed, then that can mitigate those kinds of failure scenarios, as well as potentially speeding to market, speed time to market by using that, the interoperability burden and so on. Slide 16 is uh, Sandbind's policy pyramid. And, and I, I wanted to include this because coming off of the DRA topic, we really feel it's better to avoid the signaling overload in the first place. Um, I do think that there's, there's going to be uh, increased uh, use of, of DRAs and, and um, probably makes sense in, in a number of cases. But there's excessive or, or, and avoidable diameter signaling between uh, many uh, 3GPP 
DCC entities in, in various charging and policy control contexts. And uh, Sandmine has been very active in educating operators about this and devising strategies to uh, address that and reduce that, uh, that signaling load. And the example we like to use uh, or, or quote is from Google, actually, where they uh, looked at uh, one web page and, and realized that the transaction rates at, at over the top speed, one web page can actually, uh, on average, be responsible for about uh, 45 HTTP requests. And when you uh, extrapolate that to uh, one gigabit per second of HTTP, that's 37,000 requests per second. So given that entitlement changes at very low rates, we really uh, espouse a distributed and hierarchical uh, policy and charging uh, framework where there's decision-making functionality in the data plane, and we really leverage capabilities at, at, at in the control plane, BSS, OSS plane, and, and data plane in order to reduce signaling and really optimize uh, things by leveraging uh, layer 7-based policies. Slide 17 illustrates this point using a, a fair use policy example. So if you think about fair use policy, which is essentially a prepaid quota management in a case where there's an existing OCS, let's say, the info required is really the, the quota, whether that's time or bytes, subscriber usage, and whatever the bandwidth limitations or limits are. That information is stored in, in different places. Uh, in the data plane, the Enforcement function node can obviously count the subscriber usage. Control plane and the ESS OSS holds the quota and the bandwidth limitation rules. In terms of what decisions are needed, basically, um, you know, when is the OCS granted quota exceeded? That's uh, when that happens. Some, some actions will take place. And for the sake of illustration, let's say that the PCDF reports the subscriber usage to the OCS, and in return there's some uh, limit on bandwidth that's implemented for subscribers who exceed the, their prepaid quota. Well, in, in a case where there's a conscious effort to reduce the signaling overload and the standby uh, approach is taken, when a subscriber connects to the network, that, that login will trigger a, a service request to the OCS, which will grant the request when there's quota remaining, and it will communicate the remaining quota to the PCEF. But instead of causing additional control traffic for every subsequent subscriber data flow or even batch of flows, subscriber usage can be calculated locally in the data plane when you combine policy enforcement point and policy decision point functions on the data plane element, which is exactly what we do with our, our standby PTS. And then remaining quota can be evaluated in real time based on the contextual information that's initially provided by the OCS at the time of login. So when the quota is exhausted and the bandwidth limiting is triggered, then there's a notification that can be sent up the hierarchy to the OCS at that point. But it, there's, um, all the interim signaling can, can really be avoided. So again, this is just a, an example of how uh, a distributed architecture can really be uh, easily implemented when the, the ideas can be uh, put to use in order to uh, reduce decision latency and reduce signaling overload, and, and thus also obviate some of the, the, the need for uh, additional elements like DRAs. Slide 18 is, is, is really uh, illustrating a BX or a usage data records. This concept is really used for offline charging. So in this case, there's what's called a, a charging trigger function, or CTF, which is part of the PCEF. Uh, in this case, in this illustration, the Sandline PTS and the data plane. And that's responsible for monitoring service usage and then generating the charging events based on it. There's a charging data function, or CDF, that's responsible for actually cutting the records, or the, the UDRs, usage data records, based on the events received from the, um, the, the trigger function. And then that gets transferred to a, a charging gateway function, which is uh, typically part of the offline charging server uh, that's responsible for uh, persistent storage of the, the records and also uh, collecting those and, and sending them to, uh, to the, the billing system. Offline charging uh, for both events and sessions is performed using uh, the RF interface, and uh, RF is, is used for non-real-time operations, obviously. Our particular RF implementation uh, shares with GY that tight integration to, uh, to our policy engine, which allows uh, traffic to be categorized into various rating groups or, or services based on layer 7 application protocols. So that allows things like um, you know records to be cut with different classification for simple zero rating like home page, sponsored content, for example, where a consumer is not charged but an aggregate record is written towards uh, the content sponsor, and various uh, variations on that like sponsored content with, with limits to the content, or sponsored content with limits to the subscriber, where for example the, the, the 
consumer would, would not be charged, but there's some limit or aggregate towards the sponsor. This is a, a very good approach. The record generator generally, or at least sandblinds, can, can generate audits at extremely high rates. So it's a standards-based approach. There's no need for a DRA, sandblind load balances in this case. There's generally little hardware performance cost to, to an offline charging server. And there's a variety of use cases that can be, can be implemented with this approach. Obviously, the main one that I touched on is, is postpaid or offline charging. But it's also good for OCS backup. If there's a catastrophic failure with the online charging systems, then um, having uh, data records as backup can obviously prevent against uh, the revenue loss in, in scenarios like that. It's also uh, very useful in business auditing and, uh, and quick stream analysis purposes. Slide 19 is just shows a, a sample format uh, with what the HDR output would look like for that record. So our, the Sandbind record generator, again, enables PCC-based mobile fixed and, and fixed mobile converged operators to implement this kind of usage measuring and categorization data record output. And it's very highly configurable in terms of traffic classification rules, service definitions rules, formatting rules, uh, etc. So whether you're tracking usage based on application category, protocol, flow or subscriber details, etc., those uh, records can be triggered by different events and uh, integrated with other products to feed those, those systems, as I mentioned. Uh, it could be OCS, OFCS, or various other business intelligence or backend systems that are consuming this kind of data. I did want to include a, a couple of slides that touch on the challenge that I mentioned off the top in terms of the need for business intelligence. This is an example of uh, one of Sandvine's analytics dashboards. It might be a little bit hard to read because there's a lot of detail on the webinar screen, but this is actually a scenario analysis screen that uh, provides operators with the ability to quantify the impact on proposed uh, usage-based billing service plan changes. So I'm not sure if you can see, but on the left there are various slider bars and parameters that can be toggled, and that enables the operator to model the usage-based billing planned scenarios uh, and see the impact on the right-hand side of the screen in terms of you know, ARPU and, and other factors. So you can manipulate the factors such as you know, percentage over quota, top-up rates, delivery costs, overage rates, and see what the monetary impact of those changes to the plans parameters would be based on real data from the network. Very useful a real-time modeling tool and very, very useful for maximizing both the, the, the applicability and match to subscribers' needs based on their historical usage, and also for maximizing our proof and uh, the value of the network in delivering these, these kinds of usage-based billing services. One more example, uh, Power of Analytics here is just showing another example of a, of a dashboard. Uh, here we're looking at the ability to explore a service plan usage um, with behavioral subscriber segmentation. So, if, for example, you want to quantify the rate of quota consumption and project the time to quota exhaustion, it's very easy to do that with, with, with analytics tools like this. You can segment uh, based on behaviors to look at, for example, um, light users, uh, typical users, heavy users. Uh, those who are frequently versus infrequently over quota, and then project the time uh, the, for those uh, various subsets of users, um, you know, how, how quickly or, or slowly they, uh, they consume their monthly quota. Finally, I wanted to, to touch on another approach to the whole um, uh, usage-based billing challenges that uh, we talked about at the beginning. Sandwich Quota Manager is another approach. This is basically an end-to-end -end solution for usage-based billing. With this, operators are able to accumulate usage data from multiple sources, including our own PTS, but also um, other devices in the network as well. The Quota Manager has the concept of, of quota wheels, which map a billing tier or plan information to associated usage caps, and that, and that could be bytes or time or events. Uh, it enables end-to-end -end management of billing cycle and various configurations for the, for the billing rollover. And finally, each quota wheel has a set of thresholds, and those thresholds can be used to, to trigger any, any desired action. Uh, so for example, notify a subscriber to create billing records or manage the subscriber's traffic in some way, whether that's you know, restricting access to a resource or, or, or what have you. So with this product, we have a standalone solution that uh, takes the place of, of a number of the other um, options that were discussed previously in, in the presentation. Um, an unlimited number of quota wheels with an unlimited number of plans. 
So a, a typical customer here will have a, a quota wheel for a monthly billing cycle, but that can be further broken down into uh, different quota wheels, for example, for peak and off-peak hours or interactive versus non-interactive traffic. And this is also inherently a, a real-time rating engine. Uh, so we're segmenting subscribers' traffic and then performing the accounting against the appropriate quota wheel. So the interface from the, the Sandline Quota Manager to external systems is, is again, a flat file uh, data records for billing records, and then there's a, there's a SOAP interface for provisioning, for example, from a top-up window. Just a summary of some of the key functionality points, the ability to count up to end independent quotas, as I mentioned, the ability to map existing tiers or, or define new ones, to define usage control granularity, whether that's daily, weekly, or monthly, or on a rolling window, and control the quota reset date as well, the time per subscriber and, and per quota wheel. There's, of course, uh, the ability to do top-ups, as I mentioned, uh, with different expirations, and the ability to zero-rate traffic, uh, including over-the-top applications like YouTube, Facebook, and so on. Uh, we also have extra scale with this. Uh, so that was one of the other challenges, as you recall, from the, from the introduction. Uh, and the reason this scales so well is, before, is because we pre-perform quota. So the, the PTS actually does a, a CCR countdown in the quota manager. That makes the, the quota extremely accurate, byte accurate, and it also results as well in fewer events toward the offline quota repository. So those events, of course, are expensive, and uh, we use this uh, accelerating update interval so that a user that's far from their quota has infrequent updates, and they get more frequent as they get closer to the threshold. That's not a standard. We can't do this with third-party vendors that we work with in a diameter context. Another use case example, real world, uh, this time as opposed to the Telefonica case which we implemented uh, with an OCS via GUI, this, this is another South American operator. Tix network this time, different service products with different uh, speed profiles, uh, the ability to zero rate uh, on an application aware basis with different quota threshold counts. More detail on these plans, different actions that can be taken on different thresholds uh, with the ability to top up and also a uh, pay per byte. Finally, I wanted to come back to uh, close with a few use case examples. Here again, the Sandline Quota Manager being used, but this time in a, in a convergent architecture. One of the needs or challenges that I mentioned off the top, if we assume a use case where Facebook traffic is zero rated, there needs to be a way to, to first identify that over the top application, of course. But uh, here I've illustrated that being done on two different access networks. So the PTS is on each access segment do that and report that usage to the uh, service delivery engine, which holds the, the, qu the quota offline. And it maintains the, the usage count for the, the Facebook rating group. It also sees back appropriate enforcement directives to the standby PTS and also uh, third-party elements. In this case, I've shown uh, PCMM enforcements for setting uh, gates on, uh, on the CMTS on, on, on the cable segment. And also a uh, note in this case, too, that it also has the ability to draw usage information from third-party uh, elements. So, you know, the PTS is, is counting traffic and, and reporting that, but the SDE also has the ability to ingest usage information uh, via IP data records and then reconcile that with the counts uh, from the PTS as well. Touching on the family plan, the use case need, this is a, a graphic representation of that. So here we're, we're looking at shared quota support with a family plan that allows quota to be shared across multiple subscribers, multiple devices, multiple technologies. One final quota manager uh, use case. This is an interesting one. Some OCSs, especially uh, legacy ones, uh, have the ability to support only a limited number or type of services, so a voice, SMS, data. But as we know, the market today wants Facebook, et cetera. So Sandline can help the OCS to support more sophisticated services by leveraging our, our rating capabilities. We also uh, reduce load by le delegating larger reservations and splitting them. So this use case is, is interesting. It, it combines, again, a couple of standby features. The quota manager, which allows the, the top of support, uh, for example, a, a one-shot and quota allocation for the user, like 100 megabytes for 24 hours. And then there's also a GY client on our service delivery engine. And that allows the SDE to be used as, as the client endpoint uh, requesting credits and, and can be extended to allow the SDE to request additional credits uh, via the OCS direct debit operation. So a number of different uh, use cases, I think. Uh, we're, we are seeing uh, quite a bit of interest in this from a number of our, our, our partners and, and customers. Some uh, OCSs uh, promote an ability to, to offload legacy prepaid IM 
uh, systems through credit pooling. But it, in certain cases, uh, the real world transaction rates can be underwhelming. Just to close with some strategies for success and re reiterate a few points that were made. To be successful with usage-based billing uh, in this architecture, there really is a need for real-time uh, traffic rating. In the Sandbind's case, uh, we have that ability in our system, the ability to segment a subscriber's traffic and, and, and rate it uh, based on a wide variety of policy conditions. You will absolutely need a seamless interoperability and the ability to deploy in mobile fixed and converged networks and enforce policy in a consistent way and count traffic in a consistent way across all of those different networks. There needs to be a, a vendor agnosticism for that reason. There's many different gateways, IP data gateway uh, vendors. Uh, there has to be consistent counting uh, and consistent uh, policy across disparate vendor networks. And finally, access network agnosticism comes back to the, the point about converged networks, the ability to deploy any mobile or, con or converged network. So these are, are some very high level but very important uh, strategies or, or needs uh, and ways to overcome some of the challenges that were discussed. I will be online to answer some questions, and I look forward to that. Finally, uh, I'd also like to thank you for, for taking the time to, uh, to join today, and uh, I hope this is uh, useful for you. Um, my contact details are here, so feel free to follow up afterwards if you have any questions. Thank you very, very much, and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thanks very much, Chris, for your report there and your insights into policy-based charging. As I said earlier, Chris is now.